Welcome back to chapter 13. This is part two of chapter 13, where we will talk about employee related liabilities and asset retirement obligations. So our first learning objective is to identify and account for the major types of employee related liabilities. So let's talk about payroll. Who doesn't like to get paid? So from a company perspective, there are a variety of liabilities related to the amounts owed to employees. So let's think about that. What type of liabilities might a company have? Well, they, they owe their employees salaries or wages at the end of each accounting period, because there may be a difference in cutoff between accounting and the actual payment to the employees. There are payroll deductions that are owed to the CRA and others potentially, and there are short-term compensating absences, uh, such as vacation days, etc., and profit sharing and bonuses. So all of these liabilities are usually reported as current liabilities because they're normally settled within the next year. Payroll deductions um, are a common area of liabilities for companies. So payroll deductions include both statutory or mandatory deductions and discretionary deductions. So if we think about our paycheck, we never see the gross amount of our salary. We always see the amount after several deductions by the employer, such as QPP, CPP, EI, and income tax withholding. So the employer makes an estimate of how much income tax each employee is required to remit according to certain calculations. And they take this amount right off their paycheck so that they don't have a huge amount owing when they file their tax return at the end of the year. There's also discretionary deductions, such as possibly insurance premiums, maybe some union dues, um, and maybe some employee savings. So until these deductions, along with matching amounts from the employer, are remitted to the government, they are classified as current liabilities. All of these amounts are always due within the next year. Short-term compensating absence. So what's a compensating absence? It basically means that you're going to be off work, but you're still going to get paid. So this can include things like statutory holidays, vacations, um, and there's two types of compensating absences. There's those that are accumulating. So for instance, some companies give employees an extra day of vacation for each year of their tenure at the company. So that would be an accumulating right, or there's non-accumulating absences. So things that you are entitled to simply by virtue of your employment, such as paternity leave, and that there's a different triggering event for those types of absences. So some accumulating absences can be carried forward to future periods. So for instance, vacation, some companies allow seven days or 14 days of vacation to be carried forward if it's not used. Some companies also allow six days to be carried forward if they're, if they're not used. Um, there are some rights that are vested. So it doesn't matter if you continue to be an employee in the corporation or not. Um, when you, if you leave, you're gonna need to be paid out for those amounts. Um, and those are called vested rights. And employers need to accrue for all of these different types of liabilities and the income and the, in, the impact on the income statement when the benefit is earned. And the best way of thinking about this is to think about how much is actually expected to be paid. So for instance, not every employee is gonna carry forward seven days of vacation. Maybe if the best estimate is that every employee can, on an average carries forward four days, then that would be the amount that the employer would accrue. So non-accumulating absences um, are those due to a specific situation. So for instance, time off for paternity leave or short-term disability if the person gets into an accident or gets sick. So the rights to these benefits are not vested. So they're not accrued as the employee serves in the, in the organization, but they wait until there's a triggering event. So if the person goes off or if the person has a baby and they wanna go on paternity leave or maternity leave for that matter, at that point, the company will need to think about accruing the entire amount of the liability um, at the time when the company has the best information to understand what that looks like. So profit sharing. Um, profit sharing and bonus agreements are, are payments that are in addition to salaries or wages often. 
um, and they can be based on regular rates of pay, productivity, or perhaps the company profits. And they're obligations that are reported as current liability. So they're usually paid out within the next year. And something to keep in mind here is that sometimes the profit sharing calculations are based on after tax income. So because the amount to be paid itself is a ta tax deductible expense, simultaneous equations may have to be set up and solved in order to figure out both the expense and the tax amount. It's important to keep in mind that under IFRS, bonus and profit sharing payments are accrued for as constructive obligations where there's a reasonable expectation that the payment will be made. So even if the payment's not officially um, declared, so to speak, um, it's a constructive obligation where they've always paid out profit sharing and they have profits, then there's definitely a constructive obligation there and where the entity has no realistic alternative but to make the payment. All right, so as far as employee uh, related liabilities go, I am posting a variety of tutorials where I will walk through quite a few questions and we can take a look at what the journal entries look like together. So let's move on to our next learning objective, which is learning objective number five. So this learning objective is to explain the recognition, measurement and disclosure requirements for decommissioning and restoration obligations. So let's jump right into that. What is a decommissioning or restoration obligation? Well, when you construct a long-lived asset, especially if you're doing any sort of damage to the environment or any sort of real invasive um, type of drilling or et cetera, then there is a liability to restore the site or the environment back to a certain condition when you're finished with your project. And this is essentially what an asset retirement obligation is. So some examples of an asset retirement obligation are decommissioning nuclear facilities, dismantling and reclaiming oil, oil and gas properties, closing and re reclaiming mining facilities, and uh, closing and remediating landfills. There were also some situations with some dry cleaners where they were pumping some fluid into the ground that was really bad for the environment. So anything kind of in that area where there's any sort of environmental impact um, probably has an asset retirement obligation. I've even seen asset retirement obligations with respect of companies that have a lot of different leases, say in shopping malls, if they're making significant leasehold improvements and they're changing the facility, significantly, then sometimes there can be an asset retirement obligation whereby if they vacate the premises, they're required to put it back into its original condition. So asset retirement obligations can really vary in practice. So how do we measure decommissioning and or asset retirement obligations? So they're measured at the best estimate of the expenditure required to settle the present obligation. And so that's important where it says present obligation because this, uh, this liability is going to take place many years in the future. We need to present value it to make sure that we're taking into account the time value of money. So for that reason, we discount the obligation. So something important here is that there's a variety of differences between ASB and IFRS. So, so far in this course, we've seen a few small differences, but nothing really significant. And there are some differences here in terms of how IFRS accounts for asset retirement obligations and how ASB accounts for them. So IFRS and ASB both capitalize the asset retirement obligation to the fixed asset or say to the mining property or whatever it is to the actual asset that you're putting on the statement of financial position at the date of acquisition. But going forward, if the, if the estimate of the asset retirement obligation increases, let's say in year three, you realize, oh, actually, I think the asset retirement obligation is going to be a bit, quite a bit more for whatever reason, then ASPE would capitalize that increase into the capital asset and IFRS would capitalize that increase into inventory. The reason why is because whatever you're selling, if you're selling barrels of oil or what have you, then that, that is considered a product cost that should be matched um, as the sales take place. 
IFRS also includes both legal and constructive obligations in terms of defining what the asset retirement obligation is. And just remembering that a constructive obligation is where the company set an expectation that they'll create a certain risk that they'll accept a certain responsibility. So for instance, let's say that, you know, there is a requirement to restore the site to this point, but if the company normally takes that extra step and restores it that much more, then they would need to value the asset retirement obligation as that entire amount. Um, whereas ASPE simply looks at what they're legally required to do. So, Let's look at the recognition. So what happens when we know we have an asset retirement obligation? Well, we add that asset retirement obligation to the carrying amount of the asset and we recognize a liability for the amount. Um, and the obligation must be recognized in the period when the obligation is incurred. So making sure that we're thinking about that matching. So we need to record it as soon as we know that we're gonna have any sort of a liability, even if it's 10 years into the future, that needs to go on our books. And we are going to discount that, though, to take into account that 10-year period. And because we're discounting it, then we're going to need to increase the value of that asset retirement obligation each period to, so that we're getting closer to the actual amount at the end of those 10 years that we think we are going to owe. And IFRS calls that interest expense, and ASPE calls that accretion expense. So what happens if the cost increases due to production? Well, the asset retirement cost, as the expected retirement obligation and costs increase due to further damage to the site from production. So the reason that we see these costs is increasing is that if there's more production than what we had expected, then that can cause further damage to the site, thereby requiring us to increase that asset retirement obligation. So what happens if we know we need to increase it? Well, in IFRS, we add it to the obligation. So the liability is gonna increase but that additional amount on our balance sheet is, or on our on the asset side is gonna go into inventory, like we said before, and ASPE is just gonna keep adding that amount into the capital asset. Ultimately, the argument is that these two really get to the same place over time, because ASPE are amortizing the capital asset um, as you are with IFRS, but you're also that additional amount that you put into inventory is getting expensed through the income statement as you're selling the goods. So in theory, you should end up with the same net income, but it's a quite a different way of achieving that. And it's important to remember that costs arising from catastrophic events do not result in an asset retirement obligation and they're not added to our balance sheet or they're added to the liability, but not to the any of the assets. So not into inventory and not into capital assets. And why is that? Well, let's think about that. So if there's an environmental cleanup cost that's required um, because of say an oil spill or the runoff of chemicals into the water table, you know, bad things here, um, then we can't add it to the capital asset or to inventory because it doesn't result in any future benefit. So there's definitely a liability and expense related to those, those types of events, but they can't go into our assets. There's no future benefit from that. Okay, so let's take a look at one example here of what ARO accounting would look like. So in this example, we've got an oil, form, oil platform erected on January 1st, 2020. The platform must be dismantled at the end of the useful life of five years. The estimated cost of dismantling it is a million dollars. And it says 80% was caused by the asset acquisition itself. The discount rate is 10%. The present value of this discount of the dismantling cost. So the present value of the million dollars is 620,920. In 2020, due to the production of oil, there's going to be an increase in the ARO of 136,602. And on January 10th, 2025, the platform is dismantled for 995,000. Quite a bit of information here. So what journal entries would we need to record to, rec to recognize this ARO? And we want to think about how those would be different via IFRS versus ASPE. So let's take a look. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is recognize the amount, um, rec recognize the asset and the arrow liability. So we know that 
of the million or of the present value was related to the asset acquisition. So let's just take a look here. So this amount here, where it says 80% is caused by the asset acquisition itself, and the present value is 620. So if you take 620.920 times 80%, you will get 496,736. And that's the amount that we're putting on our books as debit asset or debit drilling platform credit asset retirement obligation. So this is a long-term obligation on our balance sheet. It's not going to be settled within the next year. We know it's 10 years out. Then we're going to need to be recording as the time goes by, we're going to record annual depreciation on this 496. So we're going to have debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation. So just like normal with the capital asset, we're going to be depreciating it. It said it had a five-year useful life. And so we're just using straight line depreciation here. So what's going to happen next is when we have, so we've recognized the fact that we've recorded the present value. So we didn't put the million on our books at day one. We put the present value um, and 80% and of that because that was related to the acquisition. So we're only at the acquisition stage of these journal entries. So we know that we're going to need to increase that present value each year to get closer to our future value of a million. So here we're going to recognize debit interest expense on under IFRS and under ASPE, it's called accretion expense. And, and then the asset retirement obligation, we're increasing our liability. And you can see the amount is exactly the same here under IFRS and ASPE, we're just taking the 496,736 and we're increasing it by 10%, which was the discount rate. Next, we know that there's going to be an increase in the asset retirement obligation. So let's just go back to the question for a second. So you can see it says an increase in 2020 due to the production of oil of 136,602. So you can see here we're increasing the cost, our liability, by 136,602. And you can just see the difference here between IFRS and ASPE. So IFRS is putting that increase into inventory and ASPE is putting that, as that increase into the capital asset or into the drilling platform. And both of them are increasing the liability by the 136,602. And then the last thing that the question tells us is that we actually settle the liability in 2025 for 995,000. Now, at that time, we would have had an asset retirement obligation on our books of a million dollars. So we're actually, the, the actual obligation was $5,000 less than what we thought. And so you can see this entry here, we need to remove the liability from our statement of financial position. So we're gonna reverse out the liability for a million. And then we're going to have the cash settlement of the 995. And then in the and then the balancing entry is a gain on the settlement of the ARL. So that's the end of chapter 13, part two. So please take time to go through the tutorial questions and make sure that you understand how you would answer an exam question related to either of these areas.